I am going to unload on you, good folks, a perspective that I hope will be congenial to you. I have reason to believe it will be. It's basically the perspective that every human being is at every instant that you're not in a coma, mind, brain, society, and culture. And that these four manifestations are each other's environments. And that uh, astonishingly, Military trainers have really nailed a lot of important practical wisdom in the area of brain, mind, society, and culture because they cultivate all of them in the course of creating a new military service member. So, with that, I will launch into my prepared <coughs> remarks. I'm going to introduce you to very few, possibly only one Greek word that you may or may not be familiar with. And that word is thumas. T-H-U-M-O-S, sometimes spelled T-H-Y-M-O-S because of the vagaries of how Greek letters are transliterated into English letters. And I believe that the norms of doing these things requires me to disclose that I uh, prepared this talk originally for a symposium at the Einstein Stiftung in Potsdam, Germany. Uh, a great gig if you can get it. <laughs> and uh, that was, of course, Albert Einstein's hometown. Anyway, um, here it goes. Homer uses the word thomas more than 700 times in the two epic poems. Plato told us that it was one third of every human soul. But the reputation of Thumas has been quite turbulent over the millennia since then. So is it that we have outgrown Thumas, left it behind in humanity's childhood and in each of our own childish histories? Along with the scholar Frank or Francis Fukuyama, who I believe many of you are familiar with as an author, and others, I've been trying to put this juicy Homeric word back into current circulation. It's a very odd thing to want to do because for both Homer and Plato, it seems to be something or other to do with killing rage, or at least with anger. Anyone talking about it, except to condemn it, might be suspected of one of those post-World War I intellectual chatterers. Burlesque in Thomas Mann's Dr. Faustus. 
these chatterers are the folks whose eyes sparkle when speaking of violence. My interest springs from 20 years of clinical work as a psychiatrist with psychologically injured U.S. combat veterans. I quickly learned of what took the greatest toll of their lives, their families, workplaces, and communities, was traumatic damage to good character. Many of the veterans we worked with had been incarcerated. Many had led violent lives since their return to civilian life. Their own violence had blighted their lives, and ultimately, I came to know that most of these men hated their own bad behavior, suffered great humiliation when they contemplated it, and the damage it had done it, the damage it had rained down on their families and themselves. They could, however, recall times when they considered virtue possible, <coughs> worth and worth the effort, and had even somewhat attained it. In the clinic, they were extraordinarily difficult. They demanded honor and, and acknowledgement. They were called entitled. Boy, is, that isn't a damning word in the mouth of a mental health person. They made self-important claims to have been players in the most significant events in all of human history. They were very ready to take ang angry and even violent offense at what they understood to be their dignity. Occasionally, they would insist that they would only deal with the person they called the head of the snake. That might be either the chief of the clinical service, the hospital director, whoever they identified as this personage. The, quote, global destructiveness of their faint fantasies, wishes, and occasional, occasionally behavior. Their vulnerability to collapses of morale, which would leave them so apathetic that they could not want or will anything at all even just getting out of bed. And also hypochondriacal preoccupations and psychosomatic disorders. All of these were frequently swept together by psychiatrists and then with the psycho jargon, narcissistic. I will attempt to persuade you to see the word thumas as a suitable bearer for the load that we want the word character to carry. Character sort of has a good vibration to it, and um, you might be wondering at this point, what is this guy up to? Anyway, so stay tuned. Traumatic damage to character is a phenomenon actively refused and denied by American psychiatry. Interestingly, it is accepted by the World Health Organization. My explanation for this strange disparity is that American psychiatry follows the flag that we first see marching with Plato and carried forward to this day. And here's what's on that flag. If you make it out of childhood with good character, with good character, nothing in the way of later 
experience can budge you off of your firm stand on virtue. Plato spoke of good breeding, we would say good genes, and, and I emphasize that Plato was no fool, and he said, and, good upbringing, both of them. If you have these two good ingredients, your character, your good character, would set up rock hard like cement. No bad experience can change that, or at least Plato said so. But his Athenian contemporaries would have considered that crackpot. Once you accept Plato's position, you end up viewing someone who misbehaves as damaged goods to begin with. The general position of American psychiatry is that any new behavior after bad experience in adulthood it is only the current expression of a pre-existing flaw. Any narrative, including incontrovertible evidence of, and here this is in quotes, betrayal of what's right, in a high-stakes situation by people in legitimate authority is taken as rationalization, merely an attempt of a character disordered patient to get over on, deceive, and manipulate the clinic clinician for some personal advantage. That's the expre expression, the the experience that a person with traumatic damage to good character has in most mental health settings. Interestingly, in Germany, Professor Michael Linden and his group at the Rehabilitation Center in Berlin has been working persistently and creatively to expand our knowledge of this territory. This territory of post-traumatic character change through a diagnosis they propose called post-traumatic embitterment disorder. The embitterment of personality. They have developed a wealth of new understanding through their work, interestingly, with East Germans whose honorable life trajectories were shot out of the sky by the reunification of Germany. Think about that one for a minute. What would, what would it look like if there were such a astonishing historical cleaver stroke in uh, our lifetimes. So, Professor Amelie Rorty, uh, a philosopher, translates the word thumas as the energy of spirited honor. In the 1920s, Swedish scholar Ernst Arbmann, who was writing in German, offered an, an illuminating German equivalent for Thumos as die ich Seele, the I soul, the soul of this I. Mm -hmm. 
the my soul, um, a very evocative term. Now, that captures its narcissistic dimension, but also sparks over into the concept of identity as it currently is used in the phrase identity politics. The conventional English translation of spirit, and that is the conventional uh, translation of this German word, is opaque or misleading. Maybe the German das Gemüt is better because of its connection with self-respect. But it's so, in modern German, it is so uh, frequently used sort of to make a joke of it. Resurrecting the, the unfamiliar Greek word thumos has some advantages. I'm here, I expect that a good many people in this room especially are familiar with the name of the, uh, I'm not sure how to give a sign of professional title to him, but Francis Fukuyama. I see a lot of heads nodding around the room. But he's, he's a well-known uh, person who has written on military philosophy and affairs. As Frank Fukuyama has pointed out, modern democracies often fail to recognize honor and the desire for recognition as part of the universal and normal makeup of humans, noticing this phenomenon only in its pathological and deformed states. Deformity of thumas is a common and disastrous complication of the primary, excuse me, the primary psychological injuries of war and is what is currently tagged PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which you'll discover that I am no great fan of this diagnostic formulation. According to Hegel, all human warfare originates in a fight to the death over honor a fight for unconditional recognition and acknowledgement. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to skip German phrases because it's burdensome to people who don't understand German enough, well enough to. So unconditional recognition and acknowledgement by an equal, which only one of them can win. In Hegel's analysis, there are two ways to lose. Death with honor, or the all-encompassing dishonor, the social death of enslavement. Honor is a social phenomenon. Its interior psychic mirror is thumos. Commenting on Plato's guardians, so this whole line of investigation goes back a very long way. Commenting on Plato's guardians, Aristotle says in the politics, quote, the attitude which some require in their guardians is to be friendly to all who may know and savage to all who are unknown. This is the attitude of the high-spirited temper, and I'll spare you my uh, pronunciation of the long Greek word. Going on, thumas is the 
faculty of our souls, and I'm still quoting Aristotle here, which issues in love and friendship. And it is a proof of this that when we think ourselves slighted, our spirit is stirred more deeply against acquaintances and friends than it ever is against strangers. This faculty of our souls, and still Aristotle, this faculty of our souls not only issues in love and friendship, it is also the source of any power of commanding and any feeling for freedom. It is thumos that causes affectionateness. For spirit, as thumos, is the capacity of the soul whereby we love. It is from this faculty that the, the power to command and love of freedom are, in all cases, derived. That is one big load for one concept to carry. And yet, this is exactly the freight that I want the, the, the idea of character to carry. And I think that many of you want that too. I have worked enough with military personnel, almost always officer personnel, to know that the word character has huge resonances in that community. Huge resonances. So I make no apologies for emphasizing it here. Current psychiatric terminology calls Lumos narcissism. Ooh. Narcissism is simply a new word for an old concept. Lumos from Homer, Plato, Aristotle, and the Athenian tragic poets. Pride or vain glory from Hobbes, Amor Cloak from Rousseau, De desire for recognition, from Hegel, narcissism from psychoanalyst Heinz Kogu, who developed and fundamentally modified Freud's ideas. <coughs> I prefer Homer's Thumas to the modern psychojargon narcissism because of the way the latter term has been pathologized and turned into a general purpose blame word. And I will spare you the usually uh, obscene uh, utterances that one encounters when somebody is saying, well, he's a narcissistic blank. We all can hear in our ears what the next word was. These thinkers over 3,000 years from Homer to Kogut have seen this feature of mental life as normal and universal even if it can develop dangerous excesses, deficiencies, or deformities. I believe that Thumas is a human universal that evolved out of warfare in our ancestral evolutionary past and still explodes in killing rage when violated. Many legal, cultural, and social changes have more or less removed these reactions from the individual realm. And I point out that we no longer 
teach our children, as the Vikings did, that a man of honor must kill someone who makes a joke at his expense or steals food from his cupboard. But this was true of the Vikings, apparently. <clears throat> However, such reactions are very much alive at the collective level, and lamentably they are regarded as both patriotic and virtuous. The modern adult's cloak of safety and guarantor of his or her narcissistic stability is is the society's image of, and I put this in quote, what's right, and the implement, implementation of what's right by power holders, along with concrete social support of a face-to-face -face community with, to whom one is attached. Now, I don't pretend to have universal meter to say which of those is more heavily weighted at any moment. I'm trying to figure this stuff out myself. I don't have it all in my back pocket. Narcissism, allegedly the most, quote, primitive of psychological phenomena, is much entwined on the body on the one hand, but is just as deeply enmeshed in the social, moral, and political. So here is my definition of thumos for modern practical use, a definition that still accommodates Homer and Aristotle without doing them Number one, the historically and social, socioculturally constructed content embodied in ideals, ambitions, and attachments. That's the content of the mass. And then there's a, an energetic term. The intensity with which these commitments are emphasized. <coughs> so strength and weakness and content are in very independently. Unfortunately, we all have encountered people who can shatter a whole raft of beautiful sen sentiments about good and bad and so forth. But who just blow in the wind. So, so those vary independently. In the normal adult world of the modern normal adult of the modern world, cognitive appraisals control the emotions and moods associated with shifts and plumas. Specifically, cognitive appraisals of agency, agency in and of the direction of change and rate of change in the connect condition of ideals, ambitions, and attachments. This is a big lump to swallow up all at once, but the basic ingredients are simple and pretty familiar. Are my ideals, ambitions, and attachments, and by attachments I mean the people we love and care about, <coughs> are they improving or deteriorating in the real world? And if so, how fast and how much? Who is doing this and why? During my years in the veterans clinic, I became fascinated with what I now call moral injury, which Pache 
Plato lay at the root of the veterans' deformities of character. My current preventive psychiatry work was presented to military forces as the prevention of psychological and moral injury. I have made the expansive claim that psychological injury, as well described by the diagnostic manuals term PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, goes deep into our evolutionary ancestry and one can observe that kind of learning about danger in one's pets. Uh, one can observe it in raccoons. If a bear leaps out of a berry patch at a raccoon, that raccoon will probably steer clear of berry patches for a long time afterwards. This is part of our pretty much universal inheritance as probably as vertebrates. But my main interest is in the prevention of personality deformities, which I now tag with the phrase moral. The breadth of the Homeric usages seems both useful and truthful to me. The 700 plus occurrences of the word are almost all very emotionally charged, but with the whole range of emotions you would expect from what I have just quoted. Love and pity, as well as anger, feel, fear, joy, as well as sorrow, elation, and despair. I want to restore this breadth to any current use of the term. Achilles identifies Hector and all Trojans as the agent of Patroclus' death. Uh, for those of you who don't recall, Patroclus was Achilles' battle buddy, his second in command for their regiment, and also his foster brother. They had grown up together. Plato uses, and just to sort of lay to rest, the question of were they also lovers? I don't know, and frankly, I don't care. It is, there is textual evidence that Aeschylus was sure that they were lovers, because there is a surviving fragment that's pretty torrid. And um, honestly, I don't give a damn. Plato uses thumos primarily in an anger-riddled martial context to which Aristotle necessarily had to respond. But Aristotle returned to the broader Homeric use, as you heard in the earlier quotation, and abstracted it to the point that it seems to mean in part the capacity to have emotions at all. Thumas is thus a container for the English word character. And we learn very vividly from Homer that character exists in dynamic relation to the ecology of social power. And, and how that is modeled and remodeled throughout life by how well or badly those who hold power fulfill the culture's moral order. This allows us then to define moral injury as the state 
arises in a person when he or she has suffered three things. One, a betrayal of what's right, and that is in the culture. By a person or social institution with legitimate authority, that's something in the social system. And I emphasize here that it's legitimate authority that has committed the violation. It's not clear to me that moral injury, at least in this line of thought, is possible in a criminal assault. Now, I can see that there might be cogent arguments that that might be not feasible. So that's one and two. Three, in a situation with high stakes for the injured person. So that the stakes obviously reside in the mind of the injured person. Whatever their, whatever the ultimate social and cultural origin of those stakes. We learn to value things the way we learn pretty much everything else as human beings from our experience significantly while growing up. When all three of these are present, betrayal of what's right by someone in legitimate authority in a high-stakes situation, the body reacts massively, and the way it reacts is as though a physical attack is in progress. And obviously, this neural and humoral response is operated by the brain. Big surprise. So there you have the human critter as a whole, culture, society, mind, and brain, with none of these having ontologic priority, meaning that just one of them is the really, 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 real business of being human. They're all equally present at every moment that we're conscious. And maybe when we're asleep, I can't tell you. I don't know and have an opinion on that. So this is a pitch, sort of an anti-reductionist pitch here, if you want to name, put a tag on it. And by saying that none of these is epiphenomenal of, the, of one of the others, it's a way of, of sort of sticking a thumb in Plato's eye and wanting to get away from any claim that any of these is merely a shadow on the wall. Brain, mind, society, and culture. Right. If people have to leave, please do so without embarrassment. Um, brain, mind, society, and culture are each other's environments and must exchange suitable inputs and outputs with each other if they are to persist in time. I would add that in the sense of biological evolution, they all co-evolved at the same time. When the physically modern, at the time, when the physically modern human, human first appeared in the upper Paleolithic, probably all four were present. There has never been a time when a member of our species has had a third of a language or consciousness, an eighth of a mind, or a half of a social system. If you take the view that the 
physical brain is prior to the artifacts that it creates and makes possible. I point out that this is true, but only in a trivial sense. It is a general biological phenomenon that organisms evolve and adapt both to their the environments that they are thrown into, but create the environment to which they adapt. And I will spare you a brief digression into termites and their amazing nests. Uh, so, the so-called evo-devo shorthand for evolutionary development community in, in embryology has shown that it's possible to do rigorous science in this kind of conceptual framework. Okay, I can't blame people for hearing the rumbling of their stomachs or the complaints of their bottoms sitting so long. I have sh shot far into the outer space of abstract concepts and want to close by bringing it back to Earth. In Achilles in Vietnam, I described a rare state of solitary, ra rapid killing frenzy that can arise in war when a soldier has experienced betrayal of what's right by a commander in a situation involving the death of a beloved con comrade, I use the term, the Norse term, berserker for this. The berserk phenomenon has riveted people's attention to a degree far out of proportion to its frequency, which is rather rare. Gun murder rampages anywhere in the world generates a flurry of references to the berserk state. These are horrible and tragic, but frankly, they are not the stuff of my nightmares. What keeps me awake at night is the post-military phenomena that the Germans experienced firsthand during the 1920s, the Freiburg. Is this a familiar term to at least some of you? I see some nodding of heads. Um, today we would call these right-wing paramilitary death squads. I fear that the historical, social, and cultural conditions in America are now favorable to the formation of such gangs. What I have to say will be an illustration of the ways that interdisciplinary analyses of the sort I sketched out can be applied to very practical, real-world needs. According to historian Bruce Goodmanson at Marine Corps University, which I believe you folks have heard of, that according to Dr. Goodmanson, who's a, a dear friend, when regular divisions of the Reichswehr, that's the German Army of World War, one, were demobilized after World War I, they mainly re returned from war as units to the geographically compact regions from which they had originally been stood up. Their reintegration into civilian life was fostered by the social bonds that they had formed by training together, going to war together, and coming home together. Their reintegration was even fairly smooth in places where the hometowns lay on the other side 
of redrawn natural boundaries after the Versailles Treaty. That's sort of astonishing, but it's a historical fact. According to Goodmanson, these regular soldiers were poor candidates for attraction into the Fry Corps and the like. In contrast, recruits to the elite Jaeger and naval infantry units were drawn into these formations as volunteers throughout, from throughout the Reich's era. They were demobilized as individuals and scattered as individuals across Germany. These were particularly responsive to recruitment into the elite patriotic ideology and tightly cohesive group practices of the Freikorps. The thought of such a phenomenon in America makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck. Here are my practical conclusions. And you may anticipate <laughs> that I'm about to tell you a story that puts the elite formations like the Army Special Forces, the Navy SEALs, the, and so on in a bad light, but I'm going to veer into a direction you may not be thinking of. The analogous group at greatest risk of attraction to such formulations is not the demobilized veterans of elite military formations, such as the ones I just mentioned, but rather the tens of thousands of armed private contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan, the, quote, trigger pullers among the contractors. Most of these will have had prior military service but may have few persisting, persisting social links to their earlier military units. They will come home from theater alone, carrying whatever psychological and moral injuries they have sat, suffered as contractors alone. If they were to ask for mental health treatment, their treatment by the U.S. government Veterans Health Scheme, known as the VA, would be greatly in doubt, and their former contract employer has no current legal obligation to provide mental health benefits, possibly heightening whatever indignant rage they carry from their moral injury. This would render them extremely vulnerable to recruitment to violent political and also criminal gangs. While I do not regard formal mental health treatment as a cure-all for such potentially dangerous problems, any incremental societal risk reduction is worth pursuing, especially if it involves fostering stable communities of such veterans in a context that opens, that remains open to the wider world. My clinical observation is that recognition by peers in a stable community of peers is the most potent anti-inflammatory treatment for injured thumbas. Now, I have had a fair amount to do with various members of the United States Congress. And when I proposed anything that might come 
contract veterans, to various congressional staff members that I've worked with, their reactions range from intense interest to angry outbursts, and I'll spare you the actual language. Another effing handout to the contractors was one such outburst. And this kind of this staffer wanted the contractors to be liable for providing such benefits, which is hard to disagree with, but you can see that it's a, a swamp. Reconnecting these contractor veterans to military unit associations reflecting their prior military service may also satisfy their, and this was Hegel's term, Zinzuka, honor count, a longing for recognition. Um, Willard Waller, a World War I infantry veteran turned sociologist, wrote in one of the best books ever written on the subject, called The Veteran Comes Back, published in 1944. He said, the veteran comes home angry. That's He pointed out that, the, that organized groups of veterans are noisy, demanding, and annoying, but that their mutual support and recognition assuages the most dangerous excesses of their anger. The typical American psychiatrist faced with the angry, quote, narcissistic veteran usually cannot see beyond the end of the pen with which he writes out a prescription to modify some chemical or other in the veteran's brain. We are so much better, we are so much better able to do something constructive with and for our fellow humans if we sought to see all four human avatars brain, mind, society, and culture at once. And I hope that you've taken in the general model of doing that that I attempted to portray in this talk. Now, I'd very much like to hear your comments, questions, and criticisms. Thank you very much.
which folks in this institution spend a lot of time thinking about, and I don't think I have to explain. Cohesion, leadership, and training. Now, those three things are like motherhood and apple pie to military professionals. Everybody's for it. And the question is, what are we doing to ourselves inadvertently or sometimes because emotions are aroused or ambitions are inflamed? job description 
compelled to be one of the combatants and uh, I I I shudder at the prospect and any decent person ought to shudder at such a prospect. So I take the point of understanding what veterans are going through is 
that, as you said, sir, uh, is the leadership of this policy but to make the decisions that they need to understand the repercussions of the decisions that they're making and what that actually means to the individual. Uh, because how we go back to 18 years of war right now, I would say that we were a very, very weak, very broken uh, force. And, um, you know, that's going to be a big ask if we're going to actually we're gonna find some near here competitor. I think after, as I said, 18 years, I don't think they have the capacity to do that. But that is something that is largely lost on our policymakers. And so uh, getting this message out, educating people, and bringing that signal by is going to be absolutely imperative to making sure that we don't find ourselves into you know, fighting the war that we, that we cannot bounce back from, that we can't possibly win. The land war in Asia certainly fits that description. I mean, if that's what people are uh, foreseeing, which is what I understand you to be, uh, we're trying.